Hi, welcome back. In this, the second in a series of five sessions that I'd like to do about discount rates and discounted cash flow valuation, I want to focus in on a trend that I find disquieting in the process of doing discounted cash flow valuations. And that is the focus, the time we spend on estimating discount rates in a discounted cash flow valuation. And it's not just practitioners, it's academics as well. If you look at all of the theory that you use in discounted cash flow valuation, all of the theory that's been developed by academics over the last 50 or 60 years, I would argue that 90 to 95 percent, perhaps even more of the papers, the research done on discounted cash flow valuation is about the D in the discounted cash flow valuation, the CAPM, the arbitrage pricing model, the modern portfolio theory model. In fact, I would argue that when academics talk about asset pricing, they're almost always talking about how to get discount rates right. Why? Because it's so much easier to develop great theory on discount rates than it is on cash flows. And let's look at practitioners. If you ask me to break down how much time a typical practitioner spends on a DCF, and you can test it out yourself if you're a practitioner who does DCFs, I'd wager you'd spend half, perhaps even 60 to 70 percent of your time on getting discount rates right. In fact, I've seen discounted cash flow valuations where 90 percent of the time is spent coming up with a discount rate. In the last moment, people wake up and say, oh my God, I don't have cash flows. Let's make up some revenues and margins and cash flows to get the process completed. And I would argue that this focus on discount rates, it's not just unhealthy, but it's leading us down the garden path when it comes to discounted cash flow valuations. So let's start with the question, why? Why do we spend so much time on, discounted, uh, on the discount rate part of the discounted cash flow valuation, on the D in the DCF? I think there are two reasons. The first goes back to how we all perhaps got introduced to discounted cash flow valuation. I don't want to make this general, but I remember the very first discounted cash flow model I was taught was called the Gordon Growth Model, a stable growth dividend discount model. It's a very clever way of introducing discounted cash flow valuation because it makes your cash flows into expected dividends and in the denominator of the cost of equity minus the growth rate. That is the model with which we start our learning of DCF, and unfortunately, it's a model that frames our thinking about discounted cash flow valuation. Because if you take a look at the model, the dividends are in a sense given, right? The company pays out what it pays out. The growth rate is often an exogenous input, a number you make up. The discount rate is often the only number that you have any control over. Because remember, the growth rate we're talking about here is a growth rate forever. So let's take an example of how discount rates play out in a Gordon growth model. Let's suppose you have a stock where the expected dividends per share next year is a dollar and the expected growth rate in perpetuity is 3% and you try different discount rates, ranging from 10% down to 4%. As my, cost, as my cost of equity, or discount rate, goes from 10% to 4%, the value of the stock goes from $14.29 to $100 per share. No wonder we think discount rates matter, because as you can see, just changing the discount rate, holding all its constant in this model, has a huge impact on value per share. The problem, of course, is neither cash flows nor growth can be held constant while you change the discount rate, but often our frame of reference is based on a very simplistic model. So I think the first reason we, we spend so much time on discount rates is we overestimate the impact getting discount rates wrong is going to have on our value, and value of the firm and value of equity for any given firm. There's a second reason, and it's a behavioral one. Everywhere, everyone likes to feel in control. And you feel in control when you're working with numbers where you can act like you're being precise even if you're not. I'm going to argue that when you do discount rates, you have at least a chance of looking up numbers, risk-free rates, risk premiums. And often you're looking at historical data. That data is really not a measure of what you should be using, but you have this false sense of precision. So if in doubt, you go look up the bait on a service, the risk-free rate on the treasury, you know, from the treasury bond rate. You look up a risk premium looking at some service that delivers a risk premium, and you get this false sense of, hey, I've got this thing nailed. I am in control. So I think the need to be in control also leads us to a discount rates because let's face it, estimating revenue growth and margins and reinvestment requires you enter much fuzzier territory. It's more difficult to feel sure about yourself. So maybe that's the reason we stay in the discount rate realm because we feel more in control. So for whatever reason, we overestimate 
the importance of disc contracts. We spend far too much time on disc contracts. So let me back that, back up that statement that we spend far too much uh, time on disc contracts, showing you two graphs. At the start of every year, this is what I do. I take every publicly traded company in the U.S. and globally, and I compute the cost of capital for that company. Why do I do it? I want to get a sense of what's high, what's low, what's typical, what's the distribution of cost of capital. And I'm going to show you what those numbers look like at the start of 2016. So this is across about 7,400 publicly traded U.S. companies, cost of capital for each company using the risk-free rate at that point in time, and a risk premium and a beta reflecting what business is there. And so I'm basically sticking with the traditional CAPM to get my cost of equity, but I'll wager the distribution is not going to look that different if I use the arbitrage pricing model or multi-factor model. So I bring in a cost of debt and a debt ratio. But let me go cut to the chase. The median cost of capital for a U.S. company at the start of 2016 was 8%. Hey, you're not surprised, right? The risk-free rate was about 2%. So 8% sounds about right, given the risk-free rate. But here's, I think, the striking number. Half of all companies, so if you look at the 25th and the 75th percentile, half of all U.S. companies have cost of capital between 6.6 and 9.2%. Think of how narrow that range is. Half of all U.S. companies, 4,200, sorry, 3,700 U.S. companies have cost of capital between 6.6 and 9.2%. If you extend it out to the 10th and the 90th percentile, 80% of U.S. companies have cost of capital between 5.2 and 10%. You're saying, well, maybe that's just U.S. companies. If I expand this to global companies, the spread gets a little wider, but not by much. The median cost of capital for a global company, now we're bringing in emerging market companies, substantially more risk, median is 8.76%, little higher than the median for the U.S. The 10th and the 90th percentile give you a slightly wider range, but not by much, 6 to 12%. 80% of all global companies have cost of capital between 6 and 12%. You think, what am I going to do with this? Well, when you compute the cost of capital for a company, you don't have that much room to run. It's some number between 6 and 12. So why are we spending 80% of our time trying to finesse and fine-tune that number when there's not that much room to be different? In contrast, if you looked at profit margins or revenue growth rates, the distributions are much wider. Your potential to be wrong is far greater on the cash flows than it is in the discount rate. If you're thinking about spending a lot of time in evaluation, you're far better off spending that getting the cash flows nailed down than getting the discount rate. And that is especially true if you're looking at younger companies. Maybe for mature companies where the cash flows have settled in, the margins are kind of predictable and stable, you can focus more time on discount rates. But if you're valuing a Facebook or a Google or a Twitter or a Snap, spend your time estimating discount rate. Spending your time estimating discount rates is, is a misallocation of your time. That time would be far better spent estimating revenue growth and costs of capital. In fact, let me go further. Let's say you don't have much time to do a discounted cash flow evaluation. You're valuing a U.S. company with all of its operations in the U.S. I would suggest that you spend all of the time you have estimating cash flows and use an 8% cost of capital, which is the median cost of capital you're going to be pretty close to the actual value. If you want to finesse it, here's what I'd suggest. And this is what I often do when I'm valuing younger companies. I spend almost all of my time, when I value a Snap or a Twitter, getting the cash flows, the revenue growth, the margins, the reinvestment. And then I go to my distribution. And rather than try to estimate a beta and a cost of equity and a cost of capital with all of the noise involved in the process, I go to the distribution and I use the 90th percentile. 12% cost of capital for a global company. Hey, you're saying it could be wrong. Well, maybe it could be 11.53 or 12.22 or 12.63%. But I'm going to be pretty close to the actual value if that's what I start with. One final suggestion. Now that you've seen the distributions for cost of capital, if you see a discounted cash flow valuation for a publicly traded company where the cost of capital is 15% or 4%, hey, there's something that you might want to question, right? 15% is way past the 90th percentile. You might want to stress test that number to see what assumptions the analyst has made to come up with that cost of capital. So knowing the dis distribution can be incredibly useful when you do a discounted cash flow evaluation. And I hope that you can find a way to bring this into your valuations. Thank you very much for listening.